Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome everyone um, to the third in our series of Empire Engineering Tech Sessions. Um, and uh, thank you very much all for coming along today to what I'm sure will be a really good chat. Um, my name is Stu Pringle. I am part of the team here at Empire Engineering, and I'm your host for today's session. Um, I'm joined today by um, one of my colleagues, um, Andrew Hodgson, and also a very special guest speaker, Ed Cramond from Wood Thilsted. And in just a moment, we will get um, Andrew and Ed to join me on stage. Um, just before we do, um, just to say Empire Engineering, we are an engineering, engineering consultancy supporting the offshore wind industry with advice, insight and technical know-how. And we're headquartered in Bristol in the UK and we have a London office and as a team, we can be deployed all around the world. OK. Um, today's topic is going to be around designing the monopile without a transition piece, why, how and when. Um, just before we get into it, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, some of you will be quite used to the Crowdcast system that we use. Um, for those of you who are new, um, you'll see the chat forum on the right hand side. You can see a few of us have been chatting already. Don't be shy, say hello. Um, and you'll also see at the bottom, ask a question. If you would like to ask a question during the session, please um, put it in there and our speakers today will be able to pick them up. Um, and finally, if any of you are struggling with audio or video quality, if you hit the little cog um, setting sign, you can um, go down to a lower resolution of video, which should improve the audio. Um, we're all beaming in from different locations today, um, so there may be the odd moment of delay or the odd pixelated um, bit of video, but we will do our best. Okay. Um, that's the housekeeping out of the way. Um, I'll introduce you to the speakers in just a moment, but I'd just like to say very quickly, thank you very much um, to our sponsors um, of the whole series who are ITH Bolting and Wood Thilstead Partners. Um, so they have helped bring this series to life um, over, over the course of this year. So thank you very much. Now then, let's talk about today's topic. Um, we are going to be um, looking at um, all things technical around the monopile um, without a transition piece, the why, the how, and the when. Um, the agenda for today's session is um, we're going to meet the speakers, we're going to look at um, the traditional design with a, T with, with a transition piece, we're going to look at the reasons to consider a TP list design, um, some of the risks to consider, and also how it can all come together, followed by final thoughts and a little bit of Q&A. Um, now then, I think without further ado, it's probably about time we met today's speakers. So I would like to welcome on stage, um, first of all, um, my colleague Andrew Hodgson from Empire. Andrew, hello, could you say a few words about yourself? Hi, Stu, thanks very much. Yeah, my name's Andrew Hodgson. Um, I'm a senior engineer at Empire Engineering. Uh, I've been with the company for about 18 months now. Um, and I've worked on uh, a range of offshore wind farms uh, in around the UK. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome along today. And also, last but not least, I would like to say a very special welcome to Ed Cramond from Wood Thilstead. Ed, could you say a few words and introduce yourself, please? Hi, Stuart. Uh, my name's Ed Cramond. I have been at Wood Thilstead for about three and a bit, three and a bit years. Um, I'm an associate director in charge of one of the project's teams at the moment. I'm a structural engineer by background. Um, and yeah, uh, it's uh, great to be here today. Excellent. And as we were discussing, one of only three people who are in, actually in the building today. So you've got a nice quiet office. Yeah, there's not, not too many people here behind me. <laughs> but if you see anyone there, you know, you can give them a wave or something. I don't know. Brilliant. Thank you, Ed. Welcome along. OK, um, I think before we get into talking about TP lists, it's probably good just to set the scene and talk about um, the traditional setup with a transition piece. Um, and I thought it'd be good for Andrew just to give us a little bit of background about what is um, a traditional design. Um, Andrew, o o over to you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Stu. Um, so I think before we start, it might just be worth considering uh, what would be in the traditional TP, um, just so we can get the terminology right and that we can just have a quick review of what needs to be relocated um, when we're looking at a TP list design scheme. So if we look at the external components, so we'd have the external working platform, the boat landing, which would be split into two sections. The top section would traditionally be uh, fastened onto the uh, the transition piece with the lower section lowered in offshore. Um, and then the rest platform, the split rest platform would be between the two. 
Uh, we'd also have the anode cage uh, and the images you can see on screen now, that's fast. They, they're mounted to the bottom of the transition piece. They could be lower down. That's just the one that we're considering today. And then in terms of the internal components, uh, there's the bolting platform at the top. There's the switchgear platform in the middle and there's the airtight platform at the bottom. Now, this is just one example of a uh, typical design. Um, they can they will vary from project to project, and this is the bolt a bolted arrangement, uh, which is diff a little bit different to the grouted. But in terms of this talk, that doesn't make too much uh, too much difference. So that's just a quick roundup of the traditional TP list design for before we get into it, and just a quick look at what we need to to move when we're considering um, a different design scheme. Excellent, Andrew, thank you very much for that. Okay, so I think um, that's a really good way to set the scene. Um, but of course, today we're talking about a TP list design. Um, so let's think about some of the reasons to consider this um, as an option. Um, Ed, let, let's go with you first this time. So come on, why, why should we consider this? Yeah, so um, we've seen an uptick in interest in, in TP list solutions from um, from clients and um, developers in lots of different directions, really. Um, and I think there's two big, uh, perhaps, uh, drivers that might, might lead you down this route. Uh, one of which is obviously the, the connection between the MP and the TP, um, either belt, grouted or bolted. Um, they, they will both have their challenges. Obviously, there's been some sort of historical challenges with grouted connections, um, but bolted connections as well are quite sensitive. Um, and the uh, issues around fabrication and and getting uh, the right level of sort of integrity in, in the connection is um, is some something that, that can add an element of risk. Um, but both of those connection options also take a, a reasonable amount of time to form offshore. And I think that's sort of the main second point is, is that the, um, uh, the project owners are really, really looking to try to uh, reduce the, the overall costs of, of both installation time and maintenance. And it might be that um, exploring a TP-less option here um, uh, would, if you get the solution right, produce um, a quicker installation and, and lower lower uh, maintenance costs in the long term. Um, of course, you need to make sure that the the design that you end up with for TP-less is um, is well well thought through. Um, otherwise, you may end up with with more uh, more challenges down the track. But but actually, your um, the, the incentive in in its in its sort of uh, simplest form, um, if you can. Uh, maximize the efficiency of the installation um, you, uh, through um, having a, a main monopile which is uh, quick to drive uh, with no connection to form, um, then you're potentially saving yourself a substantial amount of time offshore. Interesting stuff. So a lot a lot of information there, Ed. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Andrew, have you got, I know you had a few points that you wanted to raise um, on, on this as well. Yeah, um, I think we, so. We've actually done a bit of a uh, concept study, which we'll look at later uh, into TP list designs. And when we did the cost analysis for it, we saw that the major costs were being reduced during the OPEX phase, and that's principally driven by the removal of or of the flange between the the monopile and the transition piece. So when we did the the concept study, we were typically seeing savings um, of around six to ten percent. Now, that might not seem particularly high numbers, um, but that's 6% or 10% of the, the overall cost of the wind farm. So as a magnitude, that is that is quite a large substantial saving. Um, we also find that the, if you can reduce the operational costs, uh, you, you start to make life extensions uh, more economically viable and you can push the life of the wind farm potentially out at the, at the far end of the project. Um, and we're also seeing that one of the benefits we identified as well was that um, the insulation contractor can get a maximum usage, at more, more usage out of their vessels. And as we'll see on the next slide, when we come to talk about risks, this is becoming a more viable option because there are now installation vessels coming to market that can handle much larger monopiles. Interesting stuff. Okay, that's really, really useful. Um, so you just mentioned the R word risks. Um, the, the, I think you know a, anything in, in, in this in this world. It's something that we need to consider. So let's 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 kiss the frog. Let's tackle it. Um, what are the, what are the potential risks to be to be aware of um, with a TP list design? Well, I think um, initially, obviously, your, your monopiles are bigger. Um, so your uh, they might be sort of 15 meters longer, um, or, or maybe more in certain certain cases. Um, that may reduce the the scope of vessels that may be able to handle those monopiles. But as, as Andrew touched on before, uh, that 
those potential vessels, are, that, that pool of vessels is potentially getting larger um, as, as larger vessels are coming onto the market. Um, there's obviously design issues, um, which we need to be aware of. So uh, driving damage on attachments for the secondary steel um, is one that will need to be looked at carefully. Um, again, it's, it's a sort of technical problem that can be solved with, with some careful detailing and good engineering, I think, in general. Um, but your, uh, yeah, it is something that needs to be sort of baked in from day one. Um, but I think the, the big one in my mind is about coordination with the installation campaign. Um, mm. The making sure that the design is sort of uh, accounting for how the installation sequence will actually take place in practice and what vessels are being used is really important to getting an efficient solution. You think that um, you may have lots of individual components for, for boat landings and external work platforms, for example, all stacked up on the installation vessel deck. All of those components take space. Um, and that can be a limiting factor as well. So making sure that um, whichever solution you go down um, is compatible with um, with the installation strategy and methodology is really, really important. Um, so that that's deck space, lifting time, uh, making sure the details are workable offshore in terms of the um, constructability, if you like, and obviously that they're robust in the long term. Uh, so yeah, uh, contractor involvement is, is is pretty important here. Excellent. Okay, so there's some 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 really really good good points raised there. Um, Andrew, any others? I mean, that was a pretty comprehensive list. Is what else should we consider? Yes, yeah, so we've, we've talked about installation uh, quite a lot, but I think it's important to, to to note the fabrication side of things as well, which which can be limited. Um, just again on, on like your loadout weights of, of a monopile which is substantially heavier um there's also kind of design issues regards uh you're going to be driving now on the w2g interface flange um so kind of careful detailing of that and, and careful detailing of the tolerances would be required at the design stage and as as ed said before um th there's another big one to, to surround this there's a significant number of additional attachments onto the primary structure and and they would be Need, they, you would need to be very careful at how you detail them and, and manage that process. Um, otherwise, you might find your OPEX savings get quite eaten into um, if you start to see fatigue failures on, on those attachments. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's all very fair, fair, fair and valid points. Okay. So let, let's let's move on. Um, we've talked a little bit about the risks there, but, but let's ask the question, how, how, how did the design come together? Tell, tell me more about that, folks. Yes, so as I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, we have done a bit of a concept study um, at Empire Engineering uh, to look into sort of how you would put the TP list design together. Um, now, I should stress as well that this is this is a concept, um, it's at concept level, so uh, it's just to be aware of that. Um, but the idea would be is that you would lower the four components on screen, the discrete components, um, onto the monopile during installation. So those four components would be the external working platform, uh, the integrated platforms, the integrated boat landing uh, and ladder, and the, the anode cage. Now, I should say as well that this is one way of doing it and that uh, these these are the kind of the solutions to the, the design issues that we we came up with when we were looking at the study. But I think just it would be worth looking at what some of those design issues are that we, we came up against and how we kind of overcame them when we had a look at this. Mm. So I think the first one to look at would be the external working platform. Um, so this would be lowered onto uh, the monopile around the outside. So there is a kind of a skirt which would sit on a uh, sit on a kind of attachment on the outside of the monopile. Now, the way that we've designed this is in order to, you do have issues with when you come to kind of overturning of that because it is being held under gravity. Now, the, the way that we did was, was to uh, put a concrete counterweight on the back of the external working platform uh, so that when you load up the front of the platform, you don't get it kind of overturning um, against the monopile. Uh, now that's one way of doing it. There are other solutions where you could fasten this down um, on on site, but it is something to be considered. Uh, there's also the kind of the issue of getting the the orientation and uh, the core centricity of the platform uh, with the monopile correct. And we've done that by including guides. Um, one in the first one in the annulus to get the core centricity, and then there's an orientation guide that would sit um, on the the external working platform skirt. Okay. 
yeah and uh, i think it's um it's a really good uh, example of how the you know that just the lifting sequence ends up um or, or the issues during lift can significantly and uh, in, influence the overall size and shape of that um of the structural design in the first place and similarly you know the the guides there um you want them to be really well coordinated with whoever's uh, you know uh, doing the installation lift um, and making sure those attachments back to the monopile are, are sufficiently robust um, to, to to handle the 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 impacts uh, for the you know the drop down load for the of the external work platform for example okay good insight um anything more on the external working platform andrew uh no i don't think so um i think it'd be worth looking at the internal platform okay uh, so so the internal platform so so we previously saw that there were three internal platforms on a TP design. Uh, when we came to do that design, uh, when I lined three three platforms up, uh, what you ended up with was just almost a skeleton of a TP uh, that would be lowered down into the monopile. And it, it makes you start to question whether or not that would be a, a good way of doing things. So rather than doing that, we, we've condensed it into two platforms. Um, now, the, the issue with doing that is if you put the, the switch gear on the top, you end up seeing in the bottom there that it, it tends to protrude from the, the, mono, from the monopile flange uh, too much to be able to actually get your, your weather tight cover over the top. So the solution we propose for this one is to move the switch gear into the tower, which I think, I think would, be, would be a good option to, to overcome that issue. Okay. Yeah, and, and certainly um, you can see that the double stacked kind of arrangement there reduces your number of lifts. Which, which helps. Um, but yeah, the, the moving that switch gear into the tower um, obviously simplifies things quite a lot from, in terms of the internals of the, of the substructure in general. Um, and so it's also, you can see on here that where, when this is stacked on, the, on the, uh, the deck of the vessel, that would obviously need to be designed for uh, transportation accelerations. And um, you know, so it's almost like another another design case for a separate steel a standalone frame there. Um, so it's a little bit uh, less uh, less common than what you'd experience in a in a conventional design when the decks aren't exposed to the same kind of accelerations. Um, in terms of you know the uh, stability issues because they're locked inside the the TP. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrew, anything on else on the integrated internal platform we need to be aware of? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, Should we I move think, on? Yeah, go on then. I think the next one's the, the boat landing. I think it's the boats. Yeah, so let's talk about that because this yeah. is a bit different. Yeah, so the, so the boat landing, um, obviously, traditionally, you would have the upper section of the boat landing on to the te mounted on the teepee uh, with a rest platform in between that staggers those. Now, because we can't do that and the entire boat landing needs to be uh, installed offshore, if you just purely lift that off the both sections and weld them together, put them together, and then intend to lift them on offshore, you end up with a staggered boat landing. Now, that's still an option, but it was getting that vertical during the lift could be quite challenging. So the way that we've kind of come around this idea is to integrate it into one continuous run and have the rest platforms as kind of uh, you laterally sidestep onto them during the ascent. Now, there's obvious issues around this when it comes to uh, the regulations, uh, whether or not this is would actually conform to that. Um, but if you're looking at uh, monopiles in, in shallower waters, uh, you could probably get away with one one single rung. Um, but obviously, this would have to be assessed on like a project by project basis. And it's not to say that you couldn't have an offset uh, ladder that would be installed in, in one lift, um, if you could get the verticalness of that right during the lift. It's just, we've chosen to go this route for the, the concept study that we looked at. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that it could be site specific, you know, that, that shallower water sites or sites with a, um, you know, a, a lower external work platform level might end up with quite a different looking um, uh, ladder and access arrangement and therefore that significantly affects this detail we've not touched very much about how whether tp list um, solutions are, are more suited to deeper or shallower water sites or or anything else but um, this is a good example of how um, the, the the wave heights and the, the site conditions might actually influence the practicalities of installing these boat landings offshore because it might drive their, their size and shape so uh, yeah it's an interesting detail okay 
interesting stuff indeed. Um, and Andrew, you wanted to talk about the anode cage as well. Yeah, the anode cage is, is an interesting one, actually. Um, so there, there's the question on every project, whether or not you go um, GACP or ICCP. Um, and I think if you look at the tp list design, if you were going to install the GACP, which is what's presented on, on screen as a potential option for that, we, we're, we're essentially doing an, a single lift to lift down this anode cage over the monopile. Now, you might find that when you actually holistically look at the entire design, this starts to pull you towards an ICCC, an ICCP um, design scheme, uh, sorry, corrosion protection scheme, which is kind of a, an interesting talking point on, in a kind of more holistic sense. But just to show that, that you can go with a GACP uh, design uh, corrosion pr protection solution if you wanted, we've put this together um, to show that. So one of the problems we overcame on this one was that if you're going to slot this down over the monopile, you need to kind of get it past the boat landing. You don't want the anode cage snagging on the, um, the boat landing mount. So the way that we've overcome that here is to create a cutout in in the anode cage to allow it to slot down. Now there's obviously the solution where you could step it out or you could have the, the anode cage just larger in, in circumference that it wouldn't snag. Um, but I think that would create a more difficult installation solution. So this is the option that we've gone for. And then there's when it's actually sitting on the mount at the bottom, there's obviously issues about stability, uh, lateral stability and uplift. So the way that we would suggest that is done is to fill these, this anode cage with grout in order to give you the ballast to prevent uplift. But it would be perfectly foreseeable to, to design a sort of self-locking solution that would lock around the mount points um, on the monopile. There's also the option to mount it on the conic section um, which is something that could be looked at, which we didn't cover in this study, but it was something that was brought up when we were reviewing it, um, which I think is quite an interesting question. Uh, and you would obviously remove a load of welded attachments um, if you were to do that. But again, it would be something that would need to be considered at, at detail, which is the best scheme to, to mount an anode cage should you choose to go with this uh, corrosion protection strategy. Okay. I could see a, a question in from Nigel on the chat said uh, why can't the anode cage be installed first and have a ring and i, I think it's a, i think it's a good one um i think here from what i can see from from andrew's detail is that this is installed fairly high up it's at the bottom of the boat landing effectively at, at that level um and i think in terms of the tolerances um you would be i guess you'd be scraping up against the stubs for the boat landing uh, correct me if i'm wrong andrew um which uh, and that would be the challenge there but perhaps if you were to mount the ring further down on the cone you'd have a larger diameter for the ring and you have probably a better chance of keeping clear uh, but still i guess the risk of snagging um it, it is still there it just need to be thought about um i think if you went for iccp obviously um you know that's maybe more suitable for a shallower site but um your uh, you, you would effectively do do away with some of this if, if you can mount your ICCP anodes on the bottom of your boat landing. Um, and that's obviously a function of, of, of doing your, your corrosion protection design properly to make sure that you've got the right spread um, of, of protection. Um, but yeah, that might make things a bit a little bit simpler. Um, but it's interesting that that, you know, again, that's, that's one of those decisions which um, isn't usually changed kind of halfway through a project. So it's almost like it needs to be thought about right at the start. Um, mm. when you're thinking about TP list design. There you go. You've got a many thanks for answering the oh, question. So there you pleasure. go. Thank you, Nigel. Um, thank you, Ed. Ed that's been re that was really useful. Okay. So, Andrew. Yes. So that's, I mean, that is just a quick roundup of the components um, that would go into this design. Uh, and I think we've looked at some of the design challenges that we faced um, and, and how we overcame them. Uh, there's obviously multiple ways of doing this. Um, that is just one of them. I did actually as well, I saw in the chat, now in the asked question, I can't find it anymore, but um, someone asked whether or not we're replacing one TP, list, uh, one TP lift with a lift for four components. Um, now the answer to that is yes. Uh, the blunt answer is yes, we would. Um, but one of the kind of advantages that we identified in this is that the, the components that you'd be lifting in as part of a TP list design are significantly lighter and significantly smaller on an individual basis than an entire TP list lift. 
And one of the ways you could gain uh, installation program optimizations is to have a smaller vessel come up behind your main installation vessel for the monopiles and install these individual components um, on the TPs. Now, there's obviously the risk in that you need to get the management of that correct. Um, but that is, it, it, it's certainly a way to, to optimize your program and it does give you the potential to do that going, going this route. Thanks, Andrew. That's 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 really really useful insight there. Um, so so in sort of roundup, um, have you any more sort of thoughts there, um, Andrew? I think I'll come to you first on on, on this. And um, no, I don't think so. I think we've we've kind of touched on on why you would do this, um, some of the risks, and then a potential design. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's very good. Okay, um, Ed, Ed, anything else? from you sort of you know in summary um for, for to, the, to this approach yeah i, I think um so the risk of repeating myself it it, it the, the getting this right is all about getting um coordination um between your designers um and your and the installation contractors and someone who's um got a, a, a clear um responsibility to to define the installation sequencing um and that actually even uh, feeds into the contractual setup. Um, I think very often for a sort of direct award conventional contract for a, for a wind farm, you might find the the TNI contract still being let at the same time as the design is progressing, um, or or at least the, 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 those processes. Certainly, the TNI contractors may not be have a, a assigned contract by the time the, the design has started, um, and that means it's quite difficult to try to fit those things together. Um, I mean, it's possible uh, with all things, but actually it might be that an EPCI contract is actually a bit better suited for making sure that the contractor's um, thinking is bound into the design from day one. Um, now, you know, as, yeah, as I say, that's not to say that it can't be done in a conventional manner at all, um, but it does mean that um, I think the the pool of vessels, is, there are more unknowns, for example, in terms of the, the contractors, the uh, preferred ways of doing things and the yeah the, the size and scales of the of the cranes and the vessels which will be using to install these things um which means it's harder to estimate whether it's actually an effective solution early on okay um so yeah it's it, it's worth looking at um but it, the, the integration of the of the of the installation process and the uh, making sure these designs are all workable um is critical for for making sure that the um the the tp list is is, is a success and economic otherwise it is likely just to make um you know uh to to, to pose a uh a, a more of a challenge um but but get it right and i think there's there's some substantial savings to be made yeah, that's a key point there. That's 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 really really good. Um, Andrew, any other sort of wrap up thoughts for you before we sort of dip into a couple of questions? No, I, and again, at risk of repeating Ed, there, I, I do think that there is there are risks identified, but I do think that if you get this right, there are savings to be made, um, which which is why it is worth considering this, even though it may be it may, it may be a new and novel solution. To, to some people, there are definitely savings to be made on it and, and it's worth pursuing. And, you know, in, in five years' time, do you think we might see a bit more of this design around the world? Yeah, I think, well, I think we will. Um, as Ed said at the very top of the, the presentation, that we're seeing an uptick in the number of, of TP list designs going in now. Um, so, so, yeah, people are doing it and, and I think they're seeing the benefits of it. So, yes, I, I do think that we'll start to see this. Very good. And we've got Ed back. There you go. My blood runs cold as host when I see things like that happen. Okay. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, is there any of the questions that have come in that are not yet covered that you'd like to maybe have a little tackle at, gentlemen? I've uh, got one from Malu Wagner. Did you look into the T uh, TNI pros and cons for solutions as well as the manufacturer pros and cons? Um, Andrew, did you, um, in, in terms of when you pull together your, your, your solution here. Um, did you go through a TNI sequencing process or uh, um, was that a, um, a mostly looking at it from a design perspective? It, it was, well, I mean, I'm a designer. Um, it was mostly looking at it from a, from a design perspective, but we did we did look at the TNI process on this, um, We which is which is where we identified the, um, the kind of the idea of using like a smaller vessel to do the smaller lifts of the, of the TP list com components. Um, and we do think that, that there are kind of opportunities to, to make gains there in terms of cost and program. So yeah, we did look at this as part of the study. Yeah, okay. I think in, in terms of the 
the vessel when we've looked at this at the 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 number of vessels out there are increasing that can that can sustain monopiles at at um long monopiles at for sites of maybe 40 meters plus um they're they're increasing obviously when you're in shallower water depths your your vessel pool will still be bigger there and that's good and obviously if you've got efficient design for your monopiles the weights will be lower as well so that's good um so uh yeah there's, there's certainly both from a kind of broad perspective like have you got a vessel which is physically big enough to the actual nitty-gritty of how do you install the boat landing successfully without damaging it um that's all of those things the whole spread of things need looking at um Malu's second point about manufacturing pros and cons is an interesting one as well i mean what you see here for um the number of attachments would significantly increase on the monopile um, which means that with this kind of serial production that we see um, the likes of the big monopile players at the moment um, it has a small number of attachments perhaps for a landing ring or um, for uh, you know, attachments for, for an anode cage or something um, but very often those um, attachments are quite expensive to do because you, you might need to take the um, take the cans off the main serial production line um, so anything we can do to try to improve um, the details for both installation and manufacturing to help um, speed those things through the factory, maybe try to reduce the amount of manual welding, welding if at all possible, um, then that, that, that would certainly be beneficial. Okay, thank you, Ed. Now, we've hit the 30 minutes, so I could let you both off the hook, but are there any more of the questions that you'd like to have a, have a shot at before we, before we go into the, the, the last lap? Let's have a look. Um, there's one from TCO about tolerances, which I think mm -hmm. is a really good one. Um, it's something that um, it's obviously it, it it really needs 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 care and attention both from um, uh, from a design side and, and fabrication side. We know that the the standard tolerances, which are there in um, in the likes of EN 1090 and, and the DMV code for uh, for for large shells, those can be comfortably um, achieved in terms of you know out of roundness um, for the um, for the for the monopiles for example um, but when it comes down to uh, making sure the individual details have got enough clearance around them that's that's something which is really really important and I think again needs early engagement it needs probably a, some sort of um, a, a point in the design process where there is definition about the required level of, of clearances around all the different um, connections um, this is yeah it, it's actually critical for getting right um otherwise yeah you'll end up with snagging you'll end up with 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 major offshore problems as um as i think the the, the question the person who asked the question was um has inferred yeah i think there's a clear theme from listening to you that the, the earlier that this can be involved the more potential gain there is um and the less potential pain mm. Very good. Well, look, um, I think I'm going to have to just about call time there on this one today. Um, I'd like to say um, thank you very much to both um, Ed and Andrew. I think they've shown um, that they've got considerable knowledge um, in this space. I'd like to thank them very much for taking the time uh, um, to speak with us all today. I'd like to thank everyone who has taken part and attended and asked questions and got involved. It's really brilliant to see. Um, again, thank you to ITH Bolting and Wood Thilstead for sponsoring um, this initiative. Um, we will be doing another tech session um, next month. So keep an eye out on the email um, and on the Empire Engineering website, and we will do something at the end of August. Um, if you would like to talk to any of the team at Empire, you can see the contact details on screen now. Um, but for now, I'd just like to say thank you very, very much again to our speakers, thank you to our sponsors, and thank you to you all from around the world today who have joined us. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion and debate. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next month. Thank you very much.